Hey everyone, I'm Howard Hahn, and I help lead Merchant Bank at Lion Tree. Today on KinderCast, I'm joined by the CEO and co-founder of Get Your Guide, Johannes Reck. I've had the pleasure of getting to know Johannes over the past couple of years, and in 2020, we were fortunate to invest in the company alongside close relationships of the firm like KKR, Tomasek, and Searchlight. Based in Berlin, Get Your Guide is one of the leading marketplaces in digitalizing the global experiences market. Travelers from over 170 countries have booked more than 45 million tours, activities, and attractions through the platform. The company has a global team of over 550 travel experts and has offices in 14 countries around the world. Johannes is a biochemist by trade, a vocal leader in the German and European tech ecosystem, a classically trained musician, and a good friend of the firm. Johannes, great to see you. Thank you for doing this. Well, thank you so much for having me. Uh, so, uh, you know, we've spent a lot of time together and I, I really would love for you to share more about like the founding story with Tao and, you know, start us from the beginning. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, you know, I'll take you up to 2008 originally when uh, Tao and I were both students at the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology uh, in Zurich. He was studying physics and I was studying biochemistry and we just both loved to travel, uh, but we didn't have any money to do so. So what we did is we set up this student club called uh, ETH Model United Nations. You're probably familiar with yeah, the concept yeah. of Model United yeah. Nations in the US. Yeah. Um, so it's basically, you know, students can be diplomats and you get together, you know, for a big conference once a year. And that conference, when we set up the club, happened to be in Beijing and we got funding from the university to go there. Um, so I booked my you know, airfare uh, to, to go to Beijing and, you know, uh, you know, I made a mistake and I ended up being in Beijing a day early and Tao and the rest of the group came one day later. And, you know, Beijing at that time, you know, was not amenable for tourists. So I, I virtually had, you know, uh, you know, a lot of trouble to even get to the hotel. And when I was there, I you know couldn't find anything to do for the rest of the day, you know, I was stuck in my hotel room. And then what happened is the next day Tao came he picked me up, you know, he became my tour guide and the city opened up and suddenly, you know, so many great experiences were unlocked. We had the best Beijing duck, we saw the summer palace, we saw, you know, the forbidden city and, you know, we would have all of these great stories, we'd meet with locals. So it was just a completely different experience. Those were the heydays of Web 2.0. Everyone wanted to build a travel community or like some sort of like network where people could exchange information. So we thought, you know, we're technologists. Why don't we launch something ourselves? You know, not so hard to do. We can just have kind of like a social network for travelers to be guides or to travel and, you know, book guides around the world. And that's how Get Your Guide came uh, to play. And we launched the original prototype of the, the, the website of what would later become Get Your Guide in, you know, late 2008. And, um, you know, we thought that our target market would be students, uh, you know, from universities just like us. Right. And um, over the course of two years, I think we signed up something like 200 students and had an aggregate of five bookings, out of which three was my mother because she took pity in our, <laughs> in our little um, student project. So... I'd say the first uh, version was very entrepreneurial. Um, you know, we did everything ourselves. We didn't spend wow. any money, um, but it wasn't very successful. However, what happened back then was that, you know, us not having any idea about tourism whatsoever, just by sheer luck hit on this massive experiences market, you know, where you had hundreds of thousands of professional experienced creators around the world, you know, from people who run, you know, buses, uh, uh, you know, to the pyramids of, of Cairo all the way to the Eiffel Tower that you just mentioned or the Louvre Museum or the local ski lift in Switzerland. And we got a ton of emails from these type of suppliers who wrote us and said, you know, you guys are really good at technology. Your website looks great. Can you do the same thing for us? Mm. And can we list on your website? And for me, like, you know, it really dawned when one of these guys sent me this, you know, I think $200 PayPal payment and said, I want to be listed. How can I be fast tracked? I was like, this is more than we ever made with our current model. Right. So there has to be a market there. And we then, and this was really epic, like, you know, rented this vacation rental in the summer of 2009 in Tuscany with like, you know, you know a group of friends, you know, drank a lot of wine and wrote the original business plan of Get Your Guide. And I still look at it, you know, from time to time today. And it was incredible because it was in a way very visionary. We kind of like wrote out what the future of this market should be and how technology could enable all of these suppliers uh, to actually, um, you know, have, you know, a 
you know, so like uh, worldwide presence towards customers and how we could help them market their products. And we then relaunched the website in January 2010. The second time around, um, it immediately caught fire. So we immediately had bookings. You know, we had, I don't know, so like 20, 30 bookings the first month, then you no know, 500 the second month, and then, then so like just steadily went up. Um, the problem was, though, that, you know, we were a bunch of, you know, young students with no job experience in Switzerland, which is, you know, arguably one of the most expensive places in the world, and we couldn't even pay our own lunch. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, right. And there was no funding available back then whatsoever. So we scrambled together, you know, a couple of loans from parents and friends and families. And so I got this, you know, grant from a local bank, which had this pioneer, you know, sort of like entrepreneurship program. But it was really difficult. And, um, you know, that's also something that, you know, I look back to and would say those were probably the hardest days. You know, we didn't mm -hmm. know whether we could survive. You know, every day was like, you know, you know constant fight, fighting for a survival. We were doing everything ourselves. I was, you know, doing customer service, um, you know, on my smartphone, which was rerouted from Skype 24 seven. We always joke we have 24 seven customer service because we were always you know, able to pick up calls. Right. We're doing sales. We're, you know, programming the website, you know, it's so like one um, of the you know co-founding group you know was doing the design so it was it was very very stressful um, but what that en enabled us ultimately is to have a really deep grasp of the business and the industry because we literally you know were so deep into the project a and that period carried on for for two three years actually you know until we you know hit something like you know 10 million in gross merchandise value that was transferred through our websites of something like two two and a half million well, what's interesting there's so many early investors who really regret uh, not investing in your company. I mean, it's pretty, it's pretty clear now, given your size and scale. Like, was that, were you already raising uh, outside capital at that point, or was this before that time period? So um, I think two things. Like one, we were really bad at raising money. We had no idea how that worked. Um, and we were so focused on our product. We were like constantly working, right? right <laughs> so we didn't right, have a right. lot of time to do anything else. And second, um, people cannot imagine this today, but you know, back then, you know, you know, venture capitalists, you know, really only wanted to bet on companies that basically had no downside risk. So if you were a first time founder or if you were in a market that was not already fully validated, meaning that there was a US company that was doing exactly the same and it was huh. already massively successful, it was really difficult to raise any funding. And that's also why our first investment um, in 2013 came from Spark Capital, a mm -hmm. US American venture firm, sure. and not from a German venture firm, because they were the first ones to actually take the bet on like a new product in a new market that, you know, was not seen before exactly like, you know, so like, you know, like other industries where people, you know, like Groupon, where they just like, like copied something locally in Germany. And, you know, it was just a knockoff right. and was easy to fund. Did you find them? They found you? They were like, where was the magical connection? So I actually, uh, I actually earned like uh, the highest frequent flyer status on Lufthansa that you can get just <laughs> by flying economy class back and forth to the U.S. <laughs> and literally visiting every single you know Sand Hill Road investor. You know, at the time I was just like, you know, as I just explained, like we were doing everything ourselves. You know, at that time we had like maybe twenty employees, most of which were interns or like very low paid, uh, you know, people. And, you know, I was like literally flying over like for partner meetings on like Mondays would we'll be back in the office, you know, on Tuesday, you know, so like, it was just wild and all of that in economy class. Right, right. <laughs> it was uh, it was pretty brutal. Um, and, you know, Spark, uh, we only met, you know, I think a couple of months into our first real fundraise, uh, but they immediately liked it. And, um, you know, Alex Finkelstein, mm -hmm. who's the partner who ended up doing the deal, um, you know, just called up a couple of suppliers and then he immediately realized what the potential was. And wow. It's surprising that you say you're not good at raising money. I've seen you do it. It's quite masterful. So um, not to embarrass you, but so it's amazing to see, uh, to think back to when you weren't where you are today, right? So bringing fast forward today, I mean, I've seen your offices. They're quite remarkable. Like, how do you think, how is, how is the vision played out, you know, over the past decade? Uh, since you started? So I think for me personally, um, one of the really transformational points in the journey was um, we went then from when we raised that first round from racks to riches. Uh, and, you know, we raised um, a total of $14 million uh, as a Series A round in 2013, which at the time in Europe was unprecedented. That was a lot oh. of money. 
Um, and after that, we made all of the mistakes. We hired the wrong people. We spent too much on marketing. You know, it's, it's like we, it's like the company was really in trouble. Our burn rate went up like crazy. We were like just you know bootstrap burning, you know, minimal capital, and then suddenly we had like you know millions of dollars of of, of burn for not, not very great things. And um, you know, we were actually starting to sink a little bit. I would say in retrospect, and it was mm. a very tough time. And you know, back then I just felt helpless. I was like, I don't know what I'm doing. Mm. You know, you know, this is just all bad. And like, I don't know how to hire the right people. And my team doesn't feel good. So it was just all not good. And then something uh, magical happened. Uh, and through a connection, um, I was introduced to Case Colon, who's the founder of Booking.com, and was also I think one of the earliest investors in Uber and you know a mentor of Travis Kalanick in, in the early days. And you know, Case called me up one Friday night, I'll never forget that, and, and basically said, I want to meet you in your office tomorrow morning. Are you ready for that? I was like, okay. And then we basically didn't leave the room for like two consecutive days. We like literally went through every single piece of, of data that I could give him. And uh, he then took it upon him, uh, A, to invest, and then also mm -hmm. to coach me and mentor me. And that was the transformational moment for me where I really learned not to just, you know, follow the business or, you know, fight fires, but really sort of create a strategy um, that ultimately also investors could rally uh, behind later. But I think raising the cash is just a function of having a vision and a strategy. I know the past couple of years, which you've been, uh, which has been impact global travel has been impacted in a couple of different ways. Curious your thoughts on uh, how you've worked around that. I know you're seeing already massive growth this year, um, but certainly it's been a tough couple of years for travel. Yeah, it was quite interesting. Um, you know, after kind of like these initial struggles, we ended up, you know, from 2014 to 2020, we doubled the business every single year. Um, you know, I still remember, you know, you know, January, February 2020, I, you know, I felt invincible. We had just raised a massive round from SoftBank Vision Fund and Temasek. So, you know, tier one investors, the business was k killing it. You know, I felt like, you know, for the first time, like, you know, the pressure was kind of relieved and like, you know, things were just flowing. And then, you know, we had this board meeting in, in Zurich and, you know, Temasek, which is the Singaporean pension fund, flew in and said, you know, Johannes, you really have to take a very close look on what's happening with with COVID and in, in Asia Interesting. and I was like oh don't worry guys I've seen crises before I've right. managed this so like nothing nothing can can bother me and you know sure enough you know three three weeks later our revenue was at zero and wow. we were in the gravest crisis you could ever imagine um, you know our industry um, the tourism industry was you know really damaged and we were even da more damaged within the tourism industry because our product you know, was not even been allowed to sell um, you know, in, in a lot of places, like a lot of attractions, museums, tours had to shut down. Certainly, yeah. So that was really something. Um, ironically, because it, I, I've been a founder and I've been through all these ups and downs before, it didn't affect me personally as much. I, I knew like, you know, we have a good cash cushion, we'll go through this and, you know, there will be light at the end of the tunnel and travel will come back. It's a fundamental human need. Like, you know, maybe it's going to be gone for like one year, two years, right. three years, who knows. But like, You didn't no, doubt it. You were like, it's coming back. A hundred percent. And I, I had the vision from day one of COVID that there's a massive opportunity in this thing, that it will be a consolidation of the market. And at the same time, it will be an acceleration coming out of COVID because digital is going to win in the long run. And mm -hmm. so like all of the old clunky businesses that were around at least before COVID, um, you know, they are going to go away. Right. And like most people don't realize, it, but 50% of travel is still being booked offline. And our industry was even more than 50% because a lot of people are queued up for the Eiffel Tower, queued up for the Louvre Museum. Right. And that was actually our biggest competition. And it was clear to me that there was an opportunity in COVID that that would change. And that's also what we're seeing now uh, coming out uh, on the other end. But it was rough for the employees. So the interesting thing about COVID, it was the, the biggest crisis was actually to motivate employees for two years to work mm. for a company that was really just being beaten down. Right. And we did a pretty good job, I would say, in, you know, so like in the first six to nine months, but it got really hard then in 2021 when we had you know, the alpha wave and then the delta right. wave and then the Omicron wave. And at some point, like, you know, you're just like, you know, this will never stop. Right? <laughs> it's right, like, well, right. you know, this will just keep on going. But thankfully, we, we made a couple of good innovations uh, during COVID. Um, one was 
Um, we started to offer a very generous salary for shares program so that we could uh, you know, sort of keep cash and, and just you know, save on salaries while employees could be incentivized through stock. And you know, 98% of our workforce actually accepted that and on average mm. cut their salaries by 30%, which really humbled me. Like we didn't Got it. give a number, but- They would defer cash to take equity. 100%. Right? So they're, long ter- they're thinking long-term you know, betting on the company. Which is right. great. And that has led, you know, among all of the senior leadership of the of the company, top uh, 50 people, you know, we had no attrition. Wow. So everyone has stayed. Um, and the th- second thing that it allowed us to do um, is because we didn't have to do massive layoffs because of that program, um, we could basically double down on product and engineering. So we really worked hard on improving our product, both on the inventory side where suppliers obviously were struggling for demand and were very creative and, and happy to kind of like do new deals with us and you know, so like help us accelerate out of the pandemic. But we also worked on the core tech product and you know now coming out of COVID have been able to double our conversion rate, for instance, you know, just right, one right. leading metric. So it's been a time of struggle, but it's also been a time of massive opportunity. And, and now we're already, you know, we're not like the market is 50% under pre-COVID levels. We're already at double of pre-COVID wow. levels globally. Um, so I'm, I'm super pumped about the future. I mean, what's also really interesting because all the, a lot of the, maybe all the experience providers on your network are, they're mom and pops, right? They're small businesses. And certainly in the past couple of years, small businesses overall have been impacted greatly. Uh, what's interesting is they can use your product to find new business, right? They can drive a lot more business by working with you versus before they didn't really have another option, right? They had to kind of stand outside and hope people walk up to them. We have grown a lot of these businesses uh, to scale, and that's also something that I'm really proud of, that we were able to give back so much to the local community and that we're being able to fund so many jobs, you know, particularly in developing countries. You know, you can imagine like a a lot of tourism that goes to, you know, a place like Southern uh, America or, you know, uh, know, Africa or Asia. Um, You know, those folks really benefit from a service like ours where they can, um, you know, through a good customer experience, really earn money and, you know, feed their families and, you know, invest in education and that. So so that's really great. And um, that's also why I'm so happy to see that now that COVID is over, that the consumer behavior comes back, that people actually travel to these places. Um, I think, you know, this is something in, in the entire tragedy of COVID um, that we've really missed in the Western world. We've been yeah. very much focused on our own countries and obviously the horrific death toll that it's taken in our countries. But we have missed how much, uh, you know, money typically flows from tourism into these, uh, you know, emerging economies and, you know, how much we've been hurting these economies by not traveling. Totally, totally. Recently, large U.S.-based tech companies like Google and Apple have announced, like, permanent return to work like how are you managing through that how do you think about that Uh, both your teams yourself your customers are also obviously starting to return to work as well yeah so um i don't think there's a wrong or right uh, solution to this and i think the debate has been you know very religious and i'm always suspicious of you know these type of religious debates where you know there's like this binary uh view uh, of the world um, I try to um, build our future of work policy very much along our cultural values um, because I think ultimately it's a cultural question. You know, what type of company do you want to be? I think you can be a great remote first company or remote only company. Mm. You can be a great in person company. It's really about like what's the type of culture that you want. And um, I think we've always had a culture of freedom and responsibility where a lot of the decision-making authority is with the teams. I try to centralize as little as possible. Um, I do believe that you know, leader, the leadership team needs to give a clear strategy, like we need to be clearly defining the vision of the company, you know, the you know, strategic uh, goals and, and the you know, top KPIs that we're chasing that mm. you know, to support that strategy. So that's our job. But then, you know, I think a lot of the decision-making authority should be with the teams. And what I realized quickly is that different teams need very different work setups. You know, most obviously, like the office team obviously needs to be in the office, right? It <laughs> right, like, right, doesn't right. really work if they, they work right. from home. On the flip side, you know, if you look at the dev- developer enablement team, I mean, those guys, you know, have purely contact with developers, most of which work remotely. So 
you know, they don't really need to be in the office as a team. So we have the full spectrum and we leave it up to the managers ultimately uh, mm. to decide. Um, and we have flipped our offices now into hot desking with specific areas and, you know, a lot of, um, you know, you know, meeting rooms that, you know, allow for hybrid meetings. And, you know, we, we said, you know, this is going to be an experiment. We'll be iterating. We don't believe anyone has the right answer to remote or not remote uh, at, at this point. And, you know, we'll try to find the best setup for us. But I think um, the reality is you need both. Um, you do need a remote because you will not be able to staff and scale, uh, a, you know, a, in this modern workplace if, if you don't offer it. On the flip side, um, I don't think that you get to the same level of trust between the different teams, particularly in a very cross-functional organization like ours, where you have sales and customer service and product UX and engineering without being co-located at least for some time in the month. Hmm. You let managers decide. Just purely principles. We huh. set three key principles. Right. Number one, um, you know, we believe in infrequent in-person interaction um, you know, to build trust. Um, and, you know, we, we believe that collaborative work, so true collaborative work where you need multiple people in the room and, you know, multiple voices, multiple opinions should be done in person if possible. Mm -hmm. While, you know, focus work, you know, just, you know, getting stuff done can be done from anywhere. Do you have a, I'm sure you do, splits of like where, where different teams end up percentage wise or yeah, so I think trends we'll, you're seeing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course, we're monitoring it and ultimately becomes, you know, like, you know, an engineer like myself you know, <laughs> loves this. It right. becomes an optimization problem now. Um, we're seeing roughly 30, 35% office occupancy on every, uh -huh. every given day. Obviously very much depends by, by team, also depends by manager. But that's okay because I think individual preferences will also be vastly different. So people can also then, you know, you know, make a decision on which team they want to join based on, you know, how much remote do they do versus how much in person. Because there's also a misconception that, for instance, all of the engineers want to do only remote. They're also mm. engineers who really like to be in person. Um, and, you know, as you probably know, uh, you know, in-person interaction is also really important for our mental health, right? Totally. So, you know, I don't think it's black and white, and I think you need to have a very flexible framework, which offers a lot of opportunity to your employees, yet still, you know, maximizes the outcome for the company. You're you're seeing seeing you in uh, Berlin. I think it might be my first like kind of work trip, right? When we came, and we had a meeting in person in the office. I mean, that was like fun, right? I had not done that in a really long time before I saw you. Yeah, like my entire senior team actually came back to, to the office already in 2021. And like, Makes you know, sense. we were hanging yeah. out together quite a bit. Um, I think if you're, you know, particularly at this executive leadership group where you make such big decisions that impact one another, it's just really important to have this like deep level of trust and to re renew that deep level of trust so that you're also capable of like having really tough conversations. I mean, I have to say just, you know, my qualitative experience is, on Zoom, you typically have a lot of very focused conversations about, you know, very, you know, topical things. But for instance, you don't have very controversial discussions on Zoom. Like, hmm. you don't, like, you know, really push yourself or, like, you know, others on, on Zoom. And I believe that's also important in an executive context, you know. You know, again, it's, like, obviously very topic-oriented, but, you know, that, that type of discussion, that challenging discussion. Is I think Zoom is hard to have a debate, right? It, it's... It's kind of hard well, to do that. Well, you're not co-located, so you, you don't pick up on all of the uh, signals. You cannot, so, so for instance, one way of giving tough feedback, right, is that you actually give it while, you know, having a very positive body expression, but you can't have that on Zoom because you're kind of like just like this little square, right? So right. your feedback will be perceived very different. The same reason why I personally really dislike giving very constructive feedback via email because it's always going to be misunderstood because on mm. email it's always like very direct, you know, you know, typically offending people. While I can tell you, so like, you know, personally that same feedback will be okay because you'll see I like you. So like this is nothing against you personally. It's right. just a feedback on how you can improve. Right, right. So do you do, you end up doing a lot of these, uh, you know, brain, I guess brainstorming sessions are pretty good in per, I found like that's pretty good in person. And It really depends, I think, also on your leadership style, what works in person, what does not work in person. Like I really like these open discussions, um, you know, brainstorming, creative work in, in person. You know, that's just, you know, the way how I prefer it um, because like, you know, the energy just sparkles uh, a lot more. 
Um, you know, we also do quarterly, you know, uh, strategic reviews in person, which is great. I really like, you know, all hands meetings in person, you know, it's right. better than via Zoom. You know, we do those hybrid, but, you know, it's just better to have the room full and like that energy. I, um, ironically, I also really love uh, one-on-ones in person much mm. more than via Zoom for exactly the same reason that we just discussed. I know you've been, you've been traveling a bit, uh, you know, selectively. Um, I'm curious, have you seen any difference in how they handle, let's call it future of work, right? Europe versus US or other places? Yeah, it's it's interesting. Um, so I would say, ironically, Europe is actually further advanced on future of work than hmm. the US, which I think has to do with the fact that the more old school European companies basically don't have a future of work. <laughs> they just go back to the office, like a lot of them just push back to the office. And the people don't like it at all. So like, they go completely. They're just like, go back. Yeah, in. like, you know, COVID is over. Like we go back to like the old world, essentially. And huh. um, and obviously all of like the more tech oriented, you know, modern companies don't want to do that because they, you know, lose their very, you know, skill, skilled employees. So ultimately, you know, we've had to come up with a solution much earlier. I think also, you know, maybe so like because I'm from Germany, we just love kind of like policy and process and all of that to <laughs> be in place early so that there are no surprises right, and right. everyone is brief and we had a proper bottom-up process to get there. Um, to me, it feels like in the U.S. it's still like very clueless in most places. Like, you know, people are very remote here right now. A lot of people have also moved. We haven't had the same phenomenon in, in Europe. Like people have not really changed their cities here. Like that has happened a lot. Hmm. So it feels like the going back to the office is a much bigger deal here that people are, you know, much more scared about. And yeah, looking forward to seeing what's coming up in the US and Silicon Valley over the next couple of months, because clearly they also need to find a solution. Totally. You've also been just touching on the US, Europe, uh, contrast in, so, in some things. Um, clearly, Europe's leading in, in many areas. Uh, you you well, touched on one. U.S. is leading in um, many more areas. <laughs> right, right. I mean, cl- climate. I'd say Europe Europe's been leading. Uh, you know, for a bit. But you've also been a big advocate for innovation in both Germany and Europe. Uh, you know, we've done deals in Germany where it's uh, it's you have to get a notary. There's some there's some process I didn't realize that beforehand. It takes some time and. The, to get you know it adds complexity versus investments in the u.s are are, are straightforward uh, relatively um i'm you know and you're and you become a leader in that field like quite an outspoken advocate for mm-hmm. uh positive change mm-hmm. um what are like just to share like what are some of the things you see that can be improved um i guess some of those lessons maybe from the u.s or other places can be learned from yeah, absolutely. I think there's a lot that we can learn from the U.S. And, you know, that's not only Silicon Valley, by the way. Um, I, you know, just to give you a story, I think that illustrates um, the differences in mentality that are underneath the surface of all of this. Um, when we started the company, and I was just in the beginning of this uh, podcast talking about how I was doing sales for Get Your Guide. You know, I was doing it, you know, in New York, and I was doing it in Berlin, and I was doing it in Rome. And, like, you know, whenever I called up, uh, you know, an attraction, a museum, or, you know, a tour uh, supplier in Europe, you know, they would want to know, are you insured? You know, how long have you been in business? Mm-hmm. Do you pay on time? You know, what's the risk when I list with you? How much do I have to pay? And like all of these questions before we could even have a conversation whether we want to do business together. In the U.S., like the conversation was always, is this your company? So you've been founding it? That's great. You're an entrepreneur. <laughs> That's amazing. Sign me up. I mean, like, sign me up. I want to be part of this. This is going to be a big new thing, right? right? So, like, you know, this is like digital tourism, you yeah, know, for yeah. destination services. I love it. You're the man. So like, <laughs> can you help me? So, like, you know, so can you tell me what to do? I want to be really big on your right, website. Right. I, want, I want to use this channel, right? Wow. So, like, how can we work together? This is, this is the difference in tone. Mm-hmm. And I think we, um, particularly in Germany, um, you know, we've had, an incredible economic run over 50, 60 years. But a lot of the mindset of particularly my parents' generation was around preservation and not about innovation. And, um, you know, you, you can see that throughout. You just mentioned the example of, you know, how we protect notaries and lawyers and how everything is like very offline and expensive. But ultimately, that is just one symptom of the bigger problem that we are not willing to change processes mm. to make things better for our customers, and in that case, the customers being the young innovators, you know, the young entrepreneurs, the people who drive GDP in the next 20, 30, 40 years and not in the next three, four, five, six. 
And um, as painful as it sounds, um, because Germany has done so well, we haven't had the pressure to innovate. You know, we've had a fantastic uh, economy that was very much reliant on, you know, our great manufacturing businesses who, you know, were increasingly, you know, first uh, exporting to the United States and then later had this fantastic Asian and particularly, you know, Chinese market that they were selling into. And they were just growing every year and, you know, profits were growing right. and you didn't need to change anything. It was working. And everyone was employed and, you know, there was a big social security system and there was really no reason to change. And um, I think I, because I'm kind of like, you know, the next generation on and I could already see that, you know, manufacturing and, you know, you know, just building cars, you know, that's not going to be the future of our country. You know, we need to get into software. Otherwise, you know, we missed a boat. And, um, you know, I was like in disagreement with a lot of people who said, you know, it's like the software thing. That's just like one small market, right? So, I mean, right. but that small market, you know, between 2009, 10, when we launched to today has grown very substantially today. Not many people doubt that anymore. Sure. And today there's a very high level of urgency, which has allowed my voice to be amplified along with the voice of many others. Um, and thankfully, the result today is that, um, you know, as of today, uh, you know, we have record numbers in venture capital funding in Europe, you know, 3x of Asia uh, in 2021, which is, you know, outstanding. This used to be a third of all of Asia, um, you know, just a couple of years ago. Uh, so I think um, there's clearly a, a bright future. I think the thing that we have as an asset is um, we have incredible universities, you know, Cambridge, Oxford, uh, ETH Zurich, Munich, Kassel. They had like lots of good tech universities. And most importantly, we now have role models and we have a lot of... Like you. Yeah, I try, <laughs> tried to play my part, but there are many, many role models, you know, that are not so like, you know, different, different, different fields. And, and I think the good thing is like young people now really want to be entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. and, you know, it's much cooler to be an entrepreneur than to be a consultant or an investment banker. Sorry, how no offense. <laughs> but <laughs> but um, and, and that was like a very important breakthrough because when I got started, you know, everyone was rolling their eyes at me and said, so like, why don't you go into consulting or like any safe job where you can make money? And like today, that's not seen the same way. And even my parents' generation, <laughs> including my parents, now right. understand that change is needed. We cannot continue the way it is and you know if the current events in ukraine uh you know have any positive th thing to them then it is that i think that transformation of the european economy is even more desperately needed and i think we'll be willing to take even greater risks you've also been i'm not sure how uh pu publicly but you've been quite a act you know successful seed investor you've backed some great companies uh, through your own capital, your network, your mentorship. I've met a lot of entrepreneurs who, uh, through you, uh, I'm appreciative, but um, I'm cur curious how you think that plays into this trend of the next generation. Yeah, my, I mean, my personal mission is, um, you know, to unlock incredible travel experiences for our Get Your Guide customers, but even beyond that, I just want to unlock as much talent around me as possible. So, when I work with entrepreneurs or when I fund businesses, it's really because I'm I'm generously, it, you know, just genuinely curious about you know their market and you know you know their personality and you know what you know they can do and how they can innovate something for customers, and just have an impact on the world. And I found some fantastic businesses through that. You know whether that's an Avi Maya Travel Perk who's you know reinventing business travel or you know Christian Hacker Trade Republic who's reinventing how Europeans save money and, you know, sort of like invest in the stock market. And, you know, for me at the center of like what I do is always the enablement of other people and passing on the knowledge that I've been fortunate to, 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 to learn over the last 10 years. And at the same time, just improve the European continent through technology and innovation. Uh, amazing. I saw that you had accepted uh, Dogecoin on Get Your Guide earlier, but I'm curious how you think about uh, just given your standing as an entrepreneur, investor, leader, thoughts around Web3, if, if we're in the metaverse, do we need to go in person to the Eiffel Tower? Or are we just we're wearing headsets and not traveling? I'm super critical of, um, you know, the idea that we'll all be living in a matrix in a couple of, of years from now. Like, you know, people have been telling me that, um, you know, since 2010, Ten that you know we should just focus on smartphone enabled tours and not have tour guides etc we've tested this many many times huh. 
the conversion rate was abysmal. People actually want to interact with other people. People want a person. Right? People want in person. People want the God. You know, surprisingly, people want the tour God. <laughs> right. um, you know, that's that's really important to them. And um, those are actually very well paid jobs just because of that. And I I do think there will be a place for more virtual reality. You know, you know definitely in gaming, we're already seeing that today. Um, but I'm very skeptical that this is going to be black and white and like we'll all travel in the metaverse. Um, you know, we, for instance, launched a you know, travel from home series. Um, so a lot of tours on, on kind of like YouTube and you know, professionally uh, produced tours uh, in, in the pandemic. And you can, could see that you know, people were quick, briefly latching onto it, but then so like it was gone essentially the moment that they could travel again mm. and could really go somewhere. Not as good as a real thing. Not as good as the real thing. So I, I don't think that that's going to happen. Web3 is an interesting thing. There's a lot going on in that uh, in that space. Um, I would say I'm definitely not the expert. Um, what I would love to see in Web3 is a real application. I think if you think of you know Web1, you know you had an Amazon and you had uh, you know an eBay very early on, and despite you know that those companies not being very economical in the beginning, there was a clear utility for the customer right away. Um, you know, Web two is the same thing, right? You know, you could also argue, you know, will Facebook ever be a big company or make a lot of money? But people, people were using it, and like the the, the social networking was real. Um, with Web three, I I can kind of like see that potentially it could have an impact on the financial industry, for instance, or other, mm. you know, the art industry, as we were discussing earlier. Right, right. But I haven't seen that true customer utility play out at scale yet in a way that, that really makes me think that, you know, this is something that will be a fundamental shift in, in society in the way how we write about it. Um, I I would love to see it, you know, very curious, but I, I, I would say I'm on the more skeptical side right now. Yeah. Yeah, it does, it does kind of remind me a little bit, Facebook were probably coming of age when we were, uh, you know, we were playing with the internet, uh, and, and some folks were like, like, what is this thing? Why are, why, why are, like, remember when people used to use anonymous names for your email? You yeah. And use like, you used that like a screen name? Yeah. And then you have real names, right? Real yeah. identity. And then now around like Web3 or Discord, people are using anonymous names again. So it's kind of interesting how, how it's come back around. Um, but I wonder if th is this our version of I don't get it because like generationally this is this is just different. I, it, 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 totally, and like you know, I always like slap myself in the face, and you know, I also <laughs> want to make sure that I'm not suddenly becoming the old guy who's just skeptical <laughs> as to people you know that you know told us that we wouldn't succeed when we started Get Your Guide for right, all of the right. same reasons. I would say though that ultimately any type of technology needs to serve the customer in a meaningful way. And I think that's something that is still to be seen, you know, whether it's cryptocurrencies or NFTs. Um, I think we're at the beginning of this movement. I think we'll only see the shakeout in the next five to 10 years. Definitely. Uh, some quick hits, uh, some recent trips you've taken, anything fun? This is my first post-COVID. <laughs> <laughs> Not much to say. Um, before that, I just had car, car car vacations with my family in Austria and Italy. Right. Which, to be honest, is not the worst thing in the world. Sure, so I can't yeah. complain. <laughs> Amazing. Any recent book you've read? I know you're an avid reader. A lot of different topics. Love yeah, how you bring up yeah. science to me. I um. I mean, it's like I'm always reading multiple books at the same time. I would say the one book, uh, particularly in the current environment, I, I didn't know how topical it was when I read it over the, the Christmas break, but um, it, it's called Pop Papa, The Open Society and Its Enemies. And I think it's a very important read in the current times. Oh, huh, interesting. What's but, the quick, what's like the quick one, two sentence? It's a it's a philosophy book with like you know uh, many hundreds of pages. So, it's, <laughs> <laughs> but I, I can give you the uh, can you give you the, the the brief highlights. So, uh, you know Karl Popper, you know who's an Austrian-born philosopher um, who emigrated uh, first to the UK and then later to uh, New Zealand during the Second World War, is I would say one of the leading you know ph philosophers of you know liberalism. You know, in the same school as Hayek and and others. And, you know, like that book is actually the study of, you know, how uh, ultimately, you know, the um, ideal society or like building up a society, uh, you know, according to certain ideals or myths um, ends up in dictatorship and why we always uh, need to uh, go through the pain of actually having the discussions and also, um, you know, the dissent 
in in the debate uh, in, in liberal democracies and why that is actually healthy to preserve our society mm. to share these different points of views even if we if we don't agree I think that's the very high level and um, he goes about this by having a longer critique of Plato um, who is the big advocate of the model society where the philosophers rule and everyone else is subordinated um, but ultimately he you know, derives very well that that will always end in tyranny. And I think um, it's something that's quite topical for today. Totally. Absolutely. Um, something you've watched lately? I don't know if you have time. Obviously, you're quite busy. And <laughs> I, I, I am, but um, I, I have to admit, like my wife and I, we, we binge out every now and then. So the latest series we've seen was Succession. I don't know if you've seen that. Yeah, we've seen it. Very dark we've one. We've seen it. <laughs> Are you caught up or...? I'm not uh, sort of like through it. I just saw season one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Amazing. But it was very depressing. I, I want to. What, what's your take? Why? Why so depressing? Well, to me, like you know, when when people just ruin the company for politics and not like you know, it's so like great and they don't focus on customers. That's just like you know, hurts me. <laughs> right, right, right. Amazing. Well, thank you so much for doing this. This was a lot of fun. It's great. Uh, thank amazing you so much for philosophy, the history of the company. Uh, we, we're really grateful, like talking about how much, you know, I totally agree. Europe, huge opportunity there. We're very bullish there. Uh, you've always guided us there as well. So we're super appreciative. I'm very happy to be part of the Lion Tree ecosystem. Thank you. Thank you.